is started with the word so. And I'm now so completely obsessed with that that I uh, managed to start every presentation by saying, don't make the first word you say so. Welcome. Hopefully you're all having a reasonably good time. Um, Aaron down the front here asked me if he could record the session, and for anybody else who's recording, yeah, I'm absolutely fine with that. Post it any way you like. Um, he then rather spoiled it by saying he wanted to get my humour out there. So having watched some very serious uh, presentations, I, I kind of wonder if I, I'm supposed to be the, the comic relief element. Um, and I need to kind of explain the title of this presentation because uh, I put the, uh, the, the uh, um, abstract in. And I expected someone to come back and say, look, you can't use that title. It's just, if, if, if nothing else, it's too long. I've probably got the two longest session titles of anybody here this week. And this is called The Joy of IntelliSense, or How to Have Expansion Plus Plus Change My Life, or How I Stop Worrying and Learn to Love Parameter Sets. And there is this basic rule that says you're not allowed to have that many massive cliches in your presentation, <laughs> certainly not in the first three slides. Uh, there's also a rule that uh, you can see in the very small type there that says you're not supposed to use comic sans and you're supposed to make your type read big enough to be readable. <laughs> so I've broken all those rules. The other rule is you're supposed to start with your name. So I'm James O'Neill. I, uh, I tweet, I blog. Um, I used to work for Microsoft. Uh, then three years ago they decided that uh, the function I was fulfilling and uh, the functions they needed to fulfill didn't quite line up. So uh, I'm doing something else these days. Um, a lot of people know the work that I did for Hyper-V and PowerShell and um, Alex this morning uh, gave me a, a very nice um, call out for some of that. So I've written some quite large PowerShell stuff over the years, I've blogged quite a lot about it, written quite a lot of articles and so on. So that's my background. When I worked for Microsoft, my job title at the end of that process was I was an IT Pro Evangelist and at heart I still am. Okay, I actually want to change the way people write PowerShell. If you don't want to be in a room with a mad English guy trying to make jokes and trying to change the way you go about writing PowerShell, now is a good time to leave. Okay. If you, the other thing is, you get to the end of the, 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 the end of this presentation. You like what I've done? Make sure you go online. Name's James O'Neill. Fill everything in. If you hate it, go online. Name's Richard Sidaway. Fill it all in, etc. <laughs> The previous session that I, I did at one of these, um, I, did a, I did a session a while ago, and I called it the, the, the top ten commandments, and they became commandments and so on. They're in this uh, book of PowerShell deep dives, uh, available in uh, all good bookstores and online, etc., etc. Um, and the theme around how I, how I want you to change what you do today is all about leveraging IntelliSense. Okay, here is the problem. I will be 50 next year. This brain is getting full. Here's some just examples of the, the crud that I carry around. I got my kids to point out to me when I came up with some bizarre fact that nobody really ought to know. And the, uh, these were just things that my, my kids pointed out over a, over a period of a few days. Okay? The brain is full. There ain't any more room in there for parameters, properties, this, that, and the other. Okay? I'm also, since I left Microsoft, having to spend more time working with Linux. Oh, lordy. I thought Linux was bad when I worked for Microsoft, but I really had no idea until I spent big chunks of my day having to deal with it. Just the number of things I have to remember to get on and do the job. Okay? The computer should be making this stuff easier, and it's making it harder. That's what I'm trying to change. So. This is really a throwback to stuff I've said before, but help the people that are going to use the stuff that you write. Okay. I'll come back to bad parameter definitions and, and bad def and parameter definitions that cover lazy coding later on. But it's one of those things to ask about. If you put things in in your parameter definitions to mean that you have to do less work writing your function, and the user has to do more work putting the input into the, your function, you're doing it wrong. Okay? You've got to take responsibility for fixing things. And some of this comes down to what I call arcane knowledge. Okay? You do a query, so you say, I want to get some files. Okay? Give me files that end with star. Great, star's the universal wildcard, isn't it? Ah, 
except for this thing, we use SQL syntax and percents the wildcard. Now, do you say, well, a user needs to know that it's percent for a wildcard here and star for a wildcard there, or do we go, you know what, actually, I'll convert the star to a percent sign. It's not difficult. Okay? My pet one, and I, I haven't got the... Actually, I have got it in the presentation. I'll come back to, come back to the pet one. So, those sorts of things are really important. IntelliSense is this huge, huge helper for input. Um, we can do stuff to help IntelliSense as well. So, one of the things that we can do, one of the first things I'll show you, is to do with output types. But I'm also going to talk about Tab Expansion Plus Plus. I said in the title of this, Tab Expansion Plus Plus changed my life. Bit of an extreme claim. Don't know if any of you have come across the book um, um, by uh, Douglas Adams and John Lloyd called The Meaning of Lif. Anybody know that book? It's a, it's a little dictionary like book, and it's got a bunch of place names in it that they've come up with definitions for. Okay? So all these words that hang around on, on place name signs and don't do any real work, they've come up with definitions for. Right? So they've got like a Vancouver, it's one of those street sweeping machines, it's a cross between a van and a Hoover. Right? On the front, <laughs> there's this big sticker that says, this book will change your life. And you go through the book and you find the definition of lift is any book that contain, has a sticker on it saying this book will change your life. So did tab expansion really make that big a difference to me? When I've finished, you'll see how tab expansion on some days saves me an hour a day. Okay? Jeffrey Snover gave me a great quote that I've used a number of times. In fact, he's given me several great, great quotes. There's another one coming up in the presentation. One of which was, programmers want neat algorithms. System administrators just want to go home. Okay, that's me. Okay, and bear in mind I work with Linux. I want to go home even more than you guys do. So, let's start with a simple one, output types, and something that's quite close to my heart, which is photography. There you go, there's a, there's a picture that uh, was taken from here only a couple of, uh, uh, I was going to say a couple of days ago, but it was actually taken yesterday. Now, I've written something that extracts EXIF data from files. Hopefully that's legible. I can make it a bit bigger if you can't see it at the back. Is it okay for size? And so what I can do is I can do read EXIF uh, IMG7 and I can read the EXIF data out of that file. All right? Very clever stuff. Yes, well done James. And I can do for both and if I set it to null you can see that there's not just EXIF data in there, there's some other XML data in there that Adobe put in because I processed this in Photoshop. So I can actually say, um, go in here and get me the, Adobe call it the ZAP information, so we'll get the ZAP details, and you can see there's this big blob of uh, XML that's embedded in the file that says everything I did with this file in um, Photoshop. So it would be great if I could just say do read EXIF and actually let's do that, do it that way around. Put some brackets around that and get the properties that relate to that. And unfortunately there's no tab expansion there. What I've done in my function. Oh, the other thing I just want to, just want to go off on a sidetrack about. It's very, very easy when you write something as involved in this to go, aren't I clever because of the stuff that happens in the body of my function? I just want you to make a note, take note of the line numbers here, okay? Um, the function ends on line 918, okay? It starts on 448. So we've got 462 lines, if my arithmetic's 460 lines, if my arithmetic's right, of stuff that munges EXIF data. Okay? It's a fair amount of work. And it's really easy to say, I've done this clever stuff, job's finished. 
I've added one little bit to define a type called EXIF. And if I just reinstate this one line here that says, in the definition of my function, I'm going to tell PowerShell what this function returns. I don't even have to return what I've told it I'm going to return. Okay? But when PowerShell does any processing of the command line, if it relates to this command, whoa, come back, James. If it relates to this command, then what PowerShell will do is it will say, I know what's coming up if you do a read exif command. I'm going to get one of these exif objects. Okay? So having reinstated that, let's just reload it. <coughs> And now, if I do read exif minus, uh, I'm getting the parameters out of order, but it doesn't matter. Dot slash that one. Dot. There's all the properties that come out of that photo. And so, if I want to actually get the descriptive bits that I uh, pulled out of uh, Photoshop, they're called desk attrib. And those are all the things that uh, it actually tells me that it's done. So you can see there it's applied a cylindrical distortion because it's stitched a bunch of photos together. Okay. How much easier is that than the alternative? I have to take that function, the output of that function, pipe it into GM, get a list of the members, find the one that I want, then go and, then go and type it in manually. So I've just saved myself a small piece of work by defining that type. The types aren't horrendously difficult to define. Okay? These are also really useful. I, I keep citing this example. I can never remember with this data whether, when I'm looking for the camera, whether it's camera maker or camera manufacturer. In fact, one of these days I'll actually get around to defining an alias so everywhere I've got them I can use both. But the, the idea is very simple. Just define a type that says, here is a type that contains the properties. Okay? Now, in, all, in this case, it's really simple, because each one is going to be a string or an array of strings. Uh, we've got one that's actually not a string, but generally, they can all be strings. And we just go through, and we go public string this, public string that, top and tail it with the definition of a structure in C Sharp. And once I've built that as a piece of text, I can then just do add type and that piece of text. It all gets compiled, loaded, magic happens in the background. I don't, you know, I don't have to understand that. It just happens, and now I can say that type is referenced in that uh, output type field. I'll come back to those a bit later on. Um, just to make it really easy for anybody who needs to get this from uh, from GitHub, uh, you can you, there you go. I knew somebody would do it. Um, you can actually scan the QR code from the screen and go and get the link from from GitHub. Um, Tab expansion plus plus was something that Jason Shirk put together. Um, I saw this at the, uh, at the equivalent of this conference last year, and it kind of registered with me a little bit, and I kind of thought. This is something that sort of lines up with some things that are bugging me at the moment to do with input. Maybe this will solve a problem that I've got. And now it's become something that I use whenever I, whenever I build anything terribly complicated. <coughs> now, this is going to appear like cheating, but I've got two demos and they're, they're actually going to work as embedded videos. Um, one of them is to do with copying files from a Linux machine. The reason that I've done this as a video, I have actually got the Linux machine running in a VM on here, um, but I didn't trust it to actually work when I got out here, so I thought, I'll, I'll save this as a video. So what I have installed on my machine is the um, net commandlets from slash n software, um, and they just allow me to transfer a file. Now, one of the, one of the things that I always puzzle at with people from the from the Linux world, is how much they will tolerate having to type great long strings of stuff in. Okay, So you want to copy a file from machine B over to your machine, machine A. So what do you do? You type in the full path to it. When you see the kind of paths that we use for our, our, the software that my, my company develops, 
um, you'll see why I don't want to do that. So let's actually click this and just show you very, very quickly what happens. So I've got some saved SSH settings. We're not truly restful here. We actually preserve it. And what you can see is as I start typing, I can tab complete. So you can see it just fills in the bits. I can tab round until I find the file that I want. And it's never terribly interesting watching somebody type in a path, but at least this is quicker than trying to remember what the path is and type it in correctly. Now, a couple of things that I've done there. When the file came back, it was nicely formatted because I've defined a bit of formatting XML. Yes, do that with your stuff. The other thing is I've made sure that it returns a file that I can treat properly. So I can pipe the output of that into this little XML pretty printer I've got for format XML, and I can pipe that into this little command edit, which I use instead of PS edit. So I can pipe some text in and it goes straight into the editor in PowerShell. So I've made sure that I don't just copy the file, I make the, the result that comes out usable, but I've also got that tab expansion. And people, even in the office, uh, still sort of look at it when, I'm, when I am doing this sort of thing and say, how are you, you're, you're on a Windows machine, how are you managing to tab complete a Linux path? Well, I've got PowerShell. So let's move completion on and do something a little bit more sophisticated than that. So um, this one is um, something that actually appears on the Where Scripting Guide blog that I, I wrote a while back, where basically I can go and query the Windows index. And what you can see coming back here, I'm actually looking up the values in the Windows index to say what fields have I got available and what are the values in some of those fields. Okay, So you can see that, again, the things that I return come back as stuff that I can work with. They're not just the, the raw data. So a couple of things couple of things in that, but the first thing on is, is about how to use Tab Expansion++. So the first is, use modules. It makes life much, much easier. So your code goes into modules. In your module directories, you put these argument completers. They go into PS1 files just like functions. And to all intents and purposes, they are functions. but they have a special header in them. That header is the argument completer header. It looks like that one you can see up on the screen there. And it basically says, this is going to complete the path parameter for the copy remote item command. You can specify more than one argument completer for uh, the same function. So you can say, this one fills in this parameter in this function, and this parameter in that function, and a third parameter in a third function, uh, and so on. <coughs> and we can have a little bit of a, a description. And then you just import the module with Tab Expansion Plus Plus. On load, Tab Expansion Plus Plus goes through all the files in all your module folders looking for functions that have got this argument completed section in. Wherever it finds them, it loads them and it associates them with the appropriate uh, section. So this one is the one that was actually being used just now in the um, get indexed item uh, demo. So you can see it basically says it's the where parameter for get indexed item. And you can see in the middle of the screen there, it takes five parameters. These are just predefined for you. And the parameters basically say, this is the work we're trying to complete. And this is what else has already been specified on the command line. Then we do some stuff, deliberately vague there. And we filter what we've got down based on the word that we're trying to complete. Sort them, and then we call this function get completion result, and basically 
what we should show in the list, which is going to be the value that will get returned, and any tooltip. Now, generally, I always set the tooltip on a separate line and then set it here. You can see in this particular example, I could actually have just written dollar underscore twice, but um, in some of them, I, I build up a more involved tooltip, and therefore, it's, it's useful sometimes to just be able to pull those out. Now, when I said about we do some stuff rather vaguely, I just want to pull out that one line there because we've got this get index item um, minus list command. And the useful thing here is if I just remember where I was, if I come back to this screen here, I can do <coughs> get indexed item minus list. These are all the properties that the Windows index knows about. Okay? So when I say, for example, I want to search for something based on a keyword, I can do that, but you notice I've got all these things that relate to music, all the things that relate to uh, uh, documents, all the things that apply across the whole system, and I've got all this long list here of possible properties that I could return. Now I'm going to show you a different one, and this is one from the, the, the sort of it changed my life thing. So I wrote something that basically um, makes calls to SQL over ODBC. When I connected to my Linux server, I created a ODBC connection which I've just left open so that I can use it from the, the get SQL command. And I actually keep track of multiple um, sessions if, if, if I need them. But basically what I can do is I can say, um, get me the contents of a SQL table. So it's just going to run select star from, well star from what? Well, here are the names of all the tables on my server. So I want to get a list of users. I can never remember, incidentally, whether this is uh, user or users, or what the prefix is. And just for convenience, I can display it as a grid for you. Okay? It's not, you know, not particularly grand as, as things go. The only difference is, of course, that if I come over to the Linux machine here, um, that's what it looks like in SQL when I actually try and, and, and return that same information uh, on the Linux machine using the, the, the SQL there. And of course I have to remember what the fields are called. So if I want to find out, for example, whether um, um, I have been set up as a user on here, I can't remember whether it's going to be forename or uh, first name or prename or any of those. It happens to be first name, so I can do first name and I, um, PowerShell style I can do like J star. And there you go, we've got people whose names begin with, um, uh, first names begin with J. Now, when you think about typing that command in longhand, it's not particularly difficult to do. Select star from Volantis user where first name like J, oh, sorry, open quotes, J percent close quotes. But it doesn't have to take some time to type. And especially when you can't remember what the field names are, because what I then had to write before I uh, in implemented all this IntelliSense was something that basically went and got me a list of tables. And then, given the name of the table, I can do describe Volantis, where is it, Volantis user. As you can see, it would have been quicker if I'd started typing user. And now I can see what the, the fields are in there. So I'd have to run two commands to find out what the parameters were to put into the command to get the data that I wanted. And then I'd have to run the actual SQL command which I can never type correctly first time either. And basically, when I sat down and timed this, it took me about a minute and a half to do most SQL queries. When I started using tab completion, it went down to about 30 seconds. So I save a minute a query. 
On a busy day, yes, I can do anywhere between 50 and 100, 100 SQL queries a day. Um, somebody is not in this session, actually. You might notice I've got the, um, the count there, 1546, as the, um, uh, the history count, so that I can do something like hash 1540 and just go back to that. If I just start a copy of Power, freestanding PowerShell, um, if I just go hash, hash read exif with a bit of luck, go on, you are going to do this for me. Ah, read minus exif even. Um, it can get that from my history because I've actually implemented persistent history for PowerShell. It's not as difficult as all that. There is an item on my blog. Um, I'm not, I might actually repackage that item for, uh, uh, for somebody else's uh, consumption, Ed. Um, so the, uh, I can actually go through and have a look at how many times I've used a particular function in a day. And I have found on, a, on the worst of days, I've done 150 SQL queries in a day. You had a question? Yeah, is uh, get sequel possible? Uh, get sequel isn't, um, and I, I keep threatening that I will f I will finally publish get sequel. I use it in so many places um, because it's it's not it doesn't just do. Oh, well, this is the other thing. Uh, just while I'm here, if I do get sequel, um, and we're going to come on to this bit a bit later, but I I've also got uh, delete, so I can basically do uh, delete. Uh, from table uh, user, and it actually turns around and says, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to let you do that without a where condition, don't be silly. Um, <laughs> and I, as I was typing that, I thought, no, that definitely does work, doesn't it? Um, so I've got all these things in there, and it also calls not just, this is, happens to be talking to my SQL, but I also use it for talking to SQLite because I query the database that drives Adobe Lightroom and I use it for poking data into Excel as well. Um, so it's, uh, it's something that I, I keep saying I will write up properly and I will share. There is a, the, the trouble is that the document, the document that I've written for it is about eight pages long at the moment and I'm trying to kind of condense it a little bit to make it only a, only a handful of blog posts rather than the, you know, a, a complete book in its own right. The, to, to just repeat that for, for, for the benefit of passing it on, in things like FIM, where you've got complicated X paths, the ability to build, the, build these things up quickly and easily is a, is a huge win. So hopefully, some of this stuff I can pass on and so on. So the key thing here, though, was this, this parameter um, list that I use with get index item. And it's what I call a show options for switch. So it will let me go and get the information for a particular, uh, um, a particular piece of data. Now, in this particular case, I've also got a, a second use for it, and that is defining these types that you saw me use for my output types before. So what I've done is I've basically said, define an empty placeholder that, it, that defines a t an indexed item type. Okay? There's, no, there's nothing in there at all, it's just empty. Okay? And then for each item in that list, insert public string and the name of that item into that list. Okay? And then add that as a type. So if I come back here to get indexed, so let's go hash indexed. No, 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 not that one. Ah, that's why. It's not actually in this session. Get indexed item uh, path. And 
then what I want is where um, keyword equals and I'm going to type it in there before it actually finishes that off for me. But now I've done the same thing that I've done with get exif that I've got that type that will complete this. But there's one other thing here which I'll come back to because it's on the, on the slides in a second. I can specify more than one type in output types. I only found this out quite recently because if you remember I was saying further up the presentation, when you return an object that's a file object, you ought to be able to, that's, that represents a file, you ought to be able to pipe it into something that expects files. Okay? Well, what I've just defined there doesn't have any of the things that relate to files. But if I say, ah, your two types, then I get the union of the two together. Okay? I, I, well, the first time I tried to do this, I tried to extend the system.io file type class, and, and you get all sorts of messages saying, ah, you can't do that, not allowed. And I thought, mm, I just wonder what happens with certain other things. So I tried specifying two, and what I get actually looks like this. So if I scroll down here, this, this is in the slides for completeness, but if I scroll down to the bottom, you can see that all these are properties, and then I've got things like copy to as a method. Well, that comes from the fact that this is a file. Okay, so all the things that relate to files I've got, and all the things that relate to my index items I've got. So, there we go, that's, that's just showing the point I've just um, explained. Did I mention the book, by the way? Yes, good. Available in all good bookstores. Um, so, just to recap those things. Remember when you're dealing with input, you can take stuff from the pipeline and you can take a comma to comma separated list and if stuff comes from the pipeline there might be more than one of it. The other thing is that that relates to the, the targets, the thing that the command's actually going to, going to go to work on. Everything else is basically how are we going to do that work. The other thing is remember to make stuff that's fit to pipe. So I can do get index items. I can then pipe that to the read exif command I was showing you. I can pipe that to where, and I can do a copy that sends it to the Linux machine if that's what I, I choose to do. Okay, that's just making that piece easy. Now I, I said I stopped myself earlier because there was one there's one particular case on user input that drives me nuts, and it's this. Okay, you go to a website. Hands up if you've got both a Visa card and a MasterCard in here. Yeah? Have you noticed that all Visa cards begin with a number four, and all MasterCards begin with a number five? And American Express cards begin with a three. Okay? This is true absolutely worldwide. Why does any website ask you what kind of card it is? Because they can tell from the number. But it's better than that. This bit that says, the value should not contain spaces or dashes. Your, I don't know, Amazon don't do this, but imagine for a second Amazon did. You have how much investment in computer technology and you can't strip spaces? This is just covering the backside of a lazy programmer. If the input could work, it's the programmer's job to make sure that it does work. Okay? It's my star versus percent for wildcards and so on. Okay. So, quite often, IntelliSense is your friend here. Here's a, an example of really good validation that PowerShell does. Okay. I said I work with the stuff in Lightroom. Does, by the way, I keep talking about photography. Anybody here use Adobe Lightroom? No, oh, one. Okay. So, you, in Adobe Lightroom, you can color code photos. Okay. So, quite often, I want to say. The photos that are, uh, have got other associated files with them, I want to color code. So basically, I can actually say here, go and uh, choose the color, but not every color of the rainbow is valid. Only this set of colors is valid as far as Lightroom is concerned. So this is really good validation. It helps the user. I don't have to think about, you know, is, is yellow in but orange is out, or is it the other way around? It's just done for me. Okay. When I did. 
that example for get indexed item, I didn't need to use that minus list that I showed you. I could have had a validate set with 78 items in it. Now, there's really good arguments for saying rather than maintaining that list in two places, actually use a parameter to the function to return the values that go in the list, but I could have done that. And then there's bad validation. I'm glad Jeff Hicks isn't in the room because I'm actually going to use an example of his code. Can you all do me a favour? I'd like you all to raise one hand. <laughs> Go on. You can do this. Now, I'm going to show you an error message. And when you tell me what I'm supposed to put in, or when you can tell me what I'm supposed to put in instead of C colon here, you can put your hand down. <laughs> Not many hands are down yet. Anybody worked it out yet? Lady at the back, you were the first to put your put your hand down. No, it's not backslash. Double backslash. It's it starts with double backslash. Uh, yeah, it's in the C path. Yeah. Okay. There is no way in PowerShell when you use the um, the validate pattern option on a on a parameter. There is no way to specify the error message. I showed this to Jer Jeffrey Snover last night, and he said, "Gee, we really ought to provide a way to give you a, a decent error message to return because this should say that doesn't look like a UNC path to me. Please enter a UNC path." They've got two hands up. Can I so come to you first and you second? You could do it with a validate script, but the validate script it do, actually does it tends to do the same thing. It says the validate script didn't return true. Yeah. Well, you could, specify the error message. You, could, you could specify a better error message. I'd rather go into the, the function and return a warning um, based on the based on the code. But there are there are good reasons why Jeffrey and I kind of go yeah. Uh, Jeffrey likes to 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 uh, think thinks that we should we should be. Um, uh, more um, prescriptive in parameters. I've actually shown you this this one, so I'm going to skip this because I've got the um, uh, I've got the virtual machine working, so I was able to show you the um, get SQL working from uh, interactively rather than the video. So on the tab expansion plus plus side. What I have to write to make my get SQL command work is um, five argument completers. Okay. So if I say, for example, um, get SQL minus connection, it will come back and say, "Ah, you want to, you've got ODBC connections." Well, there's the list of ODBC connections. Right. If I've defined multiple, if I've defined, uh, that's interesting. That didn't. Uh, in fact, that's that's working the way it's supposed to work. Um, there's supposed to be a there's a there's a, a force command that says if you don't if you it won't overwrite the default connection um, if you if you specify that without saying explicitly that you want to do that. If I say give me the sessions, then it says well actually you've got those sessions going on at the moment. So you can see LR is the Lightroom session. So I can say, OK, I'm going to query the tables in Lightroom. And it comes back and it says, OK, well, these are the Adobe tables in the SQL Lite database. OK, so I've then got the connections, the databases. Not every ODBC driver allows you to change databases. Usually, that's only when you're talking to a server. And then show tables and describe that you, you saw me use. So here is the actual code to do it. And the only thing that's different from the, the example I had up before is this piece here where it says, if we've got um, a table already specified, and if we've got a session already specified, then those need to go into the command that you're running. So here, what we've said is, we're going to fill in where to fit this on the slide, I've actually taken out some of the other places where we put field names. This is going to go into where, doesn't matter if I call this a SQL or get SQL, and you need to call get SQL 
with those parameters that you've already picked up from the command line. Then we can actually say, in this case, return, and you can see here, I've got a, a more sensible tooltip, so I say what the type of the, um, the data is, and return that information. Did I mention the book? Um, on the parameter set side, one of the things that I had in the book was keep your parameters simple. Don't overdo it. Over-validating things, specifying types when you don't need to, sometimes that ends up creating a trap for users. Um, my issue with parameter sets is, don't they just add complexity? Are they actually necessary? And the answer is, that get SQL command I showed you has got 26 different parameters. Wouldn't it be better if I filtered out the ones that didn't apply? Well, yes it would, but then I've got to learn to love parameter sets. So, this is making IntelliSense context sensitive. Okay, you can see when I do SQL minus delete, I get something different from if I do SQL minus show tables. Show tables basically gets rid of everything. Delete allows me to specify the where condition, the table, and so on. Okay, so I had to try and figure out which of my parameters were used in which circumstances. So I tried to draw a diagram of it. Didn't work. I ended up building this table, and actually the table became quite easy, because I had a list of my parameters, and I could say, in which circumstance do I use this, this parameter? So is it optional, mandatory, or not used here? Um, and I can say, is it definitely part of this set, or is it usable everywhere? So if you look at the, uh, the SQL one here, this is basically a string that can get appended to any other thing that we've built up. So this is usable absolutely everywhere. Okay? So in connection and session and so on. But other ones, we can say, well actually, grid view only applies if you're running a query that returns some results. If you're doing delete or update, there's no point in offering grid view. So, um, this is how the parameter set definitions ended up looking. And just to show you those in context, here they are in Get SQL. Uh, Get SQL, uh, you can see here, um, we've got help text is about 70 lines from 8 to 78. 79 is where parameters begin. 169 is the end of the parameter block. Okay, I've got 90 lines of parameter definitions, but I've only got. Uh, about a uh, hundred and something lines of um, about 120 lines of actual code in there. Okay, so the parameter block is very nearly as big as the code. Well, I learned a number of things doing this. The first is, and again, it's one of the things from my my talks in the past. If you write the example parts of your online help really early in the process. They give you a de facto specification. Okay? You, they also give you your use cases. So you can say, I expect my function to be used like this. Therefore, I know what my sets are going to be. Because hopefully, for each use case, you've got a parameter set. Sometimes it's useful to, de to define one of the parameter sets as the default, even if you're not going to really be using that parameter set. In mine, the, there's one called describe which acts as the default, but that's simply for my convenience. It doesn't mean the default is like I'm describing tables. So if you do that, don't rely on the, I think it's .ps commandlet dot parameter set name. The final thing is that parameter sets are, are icing on the cake. You've got the thing working, now you're trying to make it easier to use. Not every function needs them. It's only the things like this one that have got 26 parameters that really benefit from parameter sets. The danger with that is that every parameter set using function you define ends up with really complicated parameter sets. 
So, um, you can live with 90 lines of parameter code, um, but it really helps if you map them out first to make life easy. So to sum up then, to people who write code, the, the, my message, my, what I'm trying to evangelize is really, really simple. If you write functions that other people are going to use, you need to shoulder the responsibility of making users' lives easier. All right? It's down to you, because nobody else is going to do it. Okay? Examples of how you can do that. Output types for IntelliSense on results. Okay? The types aren't that difficult. They're C-sharp code, but you can see they're really easy templates to fill in. Show me the option switches. If you've got one of those, that says, really, I need to work with tab expansion plus plus. So there it is. Use it. If you can get a list, you can make it a pick list. And you can cut down the clutter with uh, parameter set names. That's it. Thank you. The appearance of Mr. Jones there basically says, for the lightning demos, we need to try and get people moving really quickly so that they're ready to go in that room. However, I am around. You can grab me in the corridors. You can ask me questions about this or any other subject you fancy. Okay, But we need to get moving ready for the lightning demos. <laughs>